Well, while King Charles was giving his Christmas message on the BBC, Stephen Fry was invited to give the alternate Christmas message on Channel 4. The much-loved British actor explained that he had Jewish heritage and asked his fellow Brits to exercise tolerance for each other, no matter their race or religion. Have a listen. But whatever our opinions on what is happening, there can be no excuse for the behaviour of some of our citizens. Since October the 7th, there have been 50 separate reported incidents of anti-Semitism every single day in London alone, an increase of 1,350% according to the Metropolitan Police. So what is my message this Christmas? The simple truth that we're all brothers and sisters. It's naive, but it's as good a message as any other. Let's bring in Spike Chief Political Writer Brendan O'Neill. Brendan, I would have thought that was all pretty good stuff, and yet, as a result of that rather benign Christmas message, Stephen Fry has received the most vile abuse. What on earth is going on in England? Yeah, you think no one could take offence at a message like that. You know, Stephen Fry is famously a national treasure here. He's very genteel. He's, he's quite posh. Uh, he's loved widely across the country. And then he does this alternative Christmas message on the scourge of anti-Semitism. And the woke mob went absolutely bananas. They went crazy. They went on the internet. They called him every name under the sun, words I could never repeat on a show like this. Uh, they called him a narcissist. They said he's a genocide apologist in reference to Israel's war with Hamas. They really went for the jugular with Stephen Fry. And these are the kind of people who pose as anti-racist, who think everything is racist. If you ask, ask someone, where are you from? Apparently, that's a racial microaggression. If you say anything critical about Islam, apparently, that's Islamophobia. These people see racism everywhere, except when it's staring them in the face. Hmm. And there has been a severe rise in anti-Semitism in Britain over the past 10 weeks. And these people just don't want to know. They say they care about racism, but when it comes to anti-Jewish racism, they either turn away or they actually justify it as a form of opposition to Israel. Yeah, well, it seems like the only form of racism that is permitted, and racism is terrible, but when it comes to anti-Semitism, somehow everybody just shrugs their shoulders and lets that go. But how is it that he can just simply warn people that anti-Semitism is not a great thing, and yet for his reward receive abuse? Doesn't that prove his point, that anti-Semitism is rife? You can't even warn against it. Yeah, it's so interesting, isn't it? You know, I think since Hamas's pogrom of the 7th of October, we've witnessed something really striking in the West, I think, which is the complete collapse of the moral authority of the woke left and the woke elites. You know, these are the kind of people who for years have posed as caring and loving and wonderful people who just want equality and just want everyone to be treated fairly and nicely. We now know, uh, courtesy of the barbarism of 7th of October, what a myth that was, mm. because they have made excuses for the pogrom of the 7th of October. They've said it was a form of resistance. There's one journalist here in Britain who called it a day of celebration. Uh, and since then, they have turned a blind eye to soaring and levels of anti-Semitism in Britain and other countries in Europe as well. Here in the UK, there have been 50 anti-Semitic attacks a day in London alone. That is crisis level racism. And they turned a blind eye to that as well. And then when Stephen Fry tried to raise the alarm bells about it, they made fun of him on the Internet and they denounced him. So the kind of people who've posed as our moral superiors for the past few decades have been exposed as real lowlifes, I think, who don't actually care about racism, don't care about equality, certainly don't care about Jewish people, and are only interested in using so-called anti-racism as a way of fortifying their own cultural power over society. So they really stand exposed. And I think the Fry, uh, the fallout from the Fry video really demonstrates that even further. Just before we move on, I want to ask you one more question on this topic. You wrote regarding the Stephen Fry a fiasco that confronting Islamists and woke anti-Semites is the pressing issue of our time. Now, I agree with you, but can you talk to me about this nexus between Islamists and the woke left? Because they would seem to have nothing at all in common, and yet they obviously do. How does that work? 
Yeah, they do. You know, in France, they refer to it as the Islamo left. You know, in France, uh, there are some still some intellectuals and politicians who are willing to confront this strange nexus, as you describe it. And I think the Islamo left is is a woke left that has become very sympathetic to radical Islam. And, and as you say, it's very strange, but I do think they share some things in common. Both sides are very hostile to Western civilization. We know that lots of young people in the West are now educated to turn their backs on Western civilization, to reject the dead white men of, of enlightenment and to reject uh, uh, white authors and so on and so forth. They're, they're encouraged to see Western civilization as a racist construct, essentially. And of course, radical Islamists hate Western civilization as well. Um, they both also think that Islamophobia is a, a crime that should be punishable. Anyone who criticizes Islam uh, should be punished. The, the woke left calls it Islamophobia and the Islamists call it blasphemy, but this, it's the same thing. They want to silence their critics. And I think they both have a problem with Jews. You know, uh, radical Islamists are upfront about their anti Semitism, including Hamas. They're virulently anti Semitic, whereas the woke left prefers to attack the Jewish state and to focus its hatred on Israel. But both of them have a problem with Jewish people. So there are these weird commonalities between the woke left and radical Islam, giving rise to what is called Islamo leftism. And it is something that I think is very worrying and has a destructive impact on our societies. Yeah, absolutely, and very well explained. Uh, speaking of Israel, uh, they're expanding their ground operation in Gaza as thousands of civilians attempt to flee the region. Tensions are escalating as well on the border with Lebanon as Israeli troops clash with Hezbollah forces. So there's a lot going on. And uh, despite calls from world leaders, there's no signs that Benjamin Netanyahu is slowing down in his assault on Gaza. Should he be slowing down or is he right to just keep pushing forward? I think Israel has every right to try to destroy Hamas. You know, uh, uh, I, war is hell. War is always hell. The war in Gaza is hell, and there is an enormous amount of suffering there. No one is going to deny that. But I think a lot of the Western media coverage overlooks the fact that Hamas started this war yeah. with its pogrom in southern Israel on, on 7th of October, it's also refusing to end the war by firstly returning the Israeli hostages and secondly by surrendering on Israel's terms, which is what Hamas ought to be doing. It is the weaker party in this conflict, but it's refusing to surrender. And in fact, it, Hamas has made it perfectly clear that it will carry on attacking Israel and it will launch more 7th of Octobers. They've said that on numerous occasions over the past few weeks. So I think the Western activists and the Western journalists who are calling for a ceasefire now, they're not actually calling for a ceasefire. They're calling for Israel to capitulate. Right. They want Israel to capitulate to a movement that is violently anti-Semitic and which has promised to attack Israelis again. So no other state in the world would be expected to live next door to a violent racist movement that threatened to kill its civilians. And yet somehow... The woke West expects Israel to put up with precisely that situation. They should be honest. They want Israel to surrender to the fascists of Hamas. That is what they are calling for when they say there should be a ceasefire right now. I think Israel has the right to pursue this terrorist movement. I wish there weren't so many civilian casualties. War is hell, which is why when this war ends with Hamas's defeat, that will be a great day. Well, I mean, it's even worse than just capitulating with a ceasefire. The Egyptians have come up with a peace plan that includes Hamas having some sort of role in the ongoing governance of Gaza. Can you believe it? Now, the Israelis are considering parts of that uh, plan by the Egyptians, particularly as pertaining the release of hostages. But you can see the pressure now building against Israel. France are pushing hard for a complete ceasefire. And it's... it's it, beggars belief that the world would seriously suggest not just a ceasefire, as you've so eloquently explained why that's a stupid move, but for an ongoing role of Hamas in Gaza. You know, I really fear that the world is turning its back on Israel. I think that's what we're seeing. And I know everyone says, well, America loves Israel and, and gives it money and weapons, etc., and, and, and the West supports Israel. I'm not sure that's entirely true. I do think there is a sense of cowardice and uh, creeping into uh, Western capitals who now look at Israel and think, 
God, do we have to put up with this pesky little country? I do sense that attitude coming through amongst Western politicians, including in France, but also to a certain extent in the UK and even the US, where Biden has told Israel to essentially calm things down and try to come to some kind of arrangement. Um, I think one problem that we face, and this is a difficult thing to say, but it is true, is that we now live in societies that don't really know what war is like and don't really think that anything is worth fighting a war for. That's the kind of societies we now live in. We, you know, War is a distant memory for most of us in the West. We don't know what it's like to have to fight street battles with an enemy that wants to destroy your country and destroy your religion. We don't know what that's like, and, and yet we think we can dictate to Israel about how it should conduct itself in just such a conflict. You know, uh, John Stuart Mill, the great liberal thinker of, uh, of 19th century England, he said war is an ugly thing, but it's not the ugliest things. Thinking that nothing is worth a war is mm. even worse. And I think those are words to live by as we look at Israel and, and as it fights to defend its own existence. And we shouldn't be so quick to rush to judge Israel for doing what it thinks is right.